this evening i'll talk a little bit about what we call the divine mother in the life of shri ramakrishna we read that he used to be in love with the divine mother he do worship the divine mother but who, what is this divine mother you may wonder to make the idea clear i have to take the help of little bit of our philosophy hindu philosophy the philosophy a question has been asked what is real and the answer has been given the answer is something which is eternal and which is changeless that alone is real then you may wonder this definition is not very good because i used to be a little baby small baby and now i am a grown up person i have changed am i not real i'm very real then again will i be eternal no because sooner or later i have to depart from this world the body will die so this definition of what is real is not acceptable then the philosophers will tell you no what you are saying doesn't make sense if you see a creature which changes its form every 10 seconds then you will not know what that creature really is the first 10 seconds it is a kitten then it becomes a puppy then it becomes some other creature then you wonder what is this really it keeps on changing i do not know what it is real because it keeps on changing then again you suppose that there is a an elephant in your backyard standing there you see that elephant only for 10 seconds then it vanishes had it been there for years and years then you could not say that that was not real so what is real is what is changeless and what is eternal so in this world everything changes if we look around we will see that everything changes and nothing seems to be eternal so then this world is not real the hindu philosophers will say yes it is not real but it appears to be real then what is real is there anything which is changeless and which is eternal the hindu philosophers will say yes there is divinity god is changeless and eternal but god they will explain that god is or divinity is beyond time space and causation god is eternity infinity and also pure consciousness and also pure bliss bliss is not joy or enjoyment that we think bliss is neither suffering nor enjoyment there is something in between the two this world is called the worlds of pairs of opposites 
in Hindu philosophy. If there is darkness, there is light. If there is joy, there is sorrow. If there is enjoyment, there is suffering. But in divinity, this duality is not there. Because our scriptures say in Sanskrit, divinity is ekam eva adhityam. It is one alone. And there is no two there. And also it is said that the divinity is beyond time, space and causation. So that's why I told you that divinity is beyond any kind of form is infinite, infinity, infinity, eternity and consciousness. That is divinity. Beyond time, space, causation. But we all exist in the world of time, space, and causation. Our minds are finite. And when we want to know anything, then we have to use our minds. So, the mind, when it tries to think of that infinity, it projects some kind of limitation on it because our mind is finite. It is like our minds are like so many colored glasses, green, red and so on. And if we look at the gray sky of Seattle, <laughs> because that sky is usually gray, there are clouds there, then the one who, has, who is looking at the sky through a pair of red glasses, the sky will look reddish and the other one who is looking at the sky through a green pair of glasses, then it will be greenish and so on. The sky does not have these colors, redness or greenness. These are being projected by the colored glasses. Every human mind is like a pair of colored glasses. Not two minds are alike. That's why when the human mind tries to think of divinity, which is beyond time, space, and spaces, causation, beyond gender and everything, then the mind projects some limitations on that divinity. The first projection is a personality. So divinity becomes a person. Person who loves his father would like to think of the divinity or God as father. Another person who is fond of his or her mother, then will think, try to think of, like to think of God as mother. And all this motherhood and fatherhood, these are being projected by the finite minds of individual beings. But divinity is beyond gender and everything beyond form, formless. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. So, there are some people who like to look upon God as Father. And they look upon God as Father and they will adore God as Father. There are others who like to look upon God as Mother and they will see God as the Divine Mother. Once one girl came to me many years ago and she was from a Christian background. She asked me, Swami, how shall I look upon God? I said, 
I didn't ask her to think of God as formless infinity and so on. Because she would not be able to understand those things. And I said, as you are from the Christian background, look upon God as Father. Then she said, no, I can't look upon God as Mother. Because my father was mean to me. Then I said, then think upon God as your mother. She said, no, I cannot do that either because my mother was also mean to me. <laughs> then I said to her, all right, then then think upon think of God as your friend. She said, yeah, I will give it a try. And she left. I never saw her again. <laughs> it's interesting. Yes, there are some people who like to look upon God as mother. And then God becomes divine mother. Aside from that, in our scriptures, it is mentioned that God, for some reason, <laughs> wanted to create this universe, which belongs to time, space and causation. When the creation happened, time and space and creation also happened. And so, before that, there was no time space. So, divinity is beyond time space. And so, those who are in this world of time space and causation, they have no other way but to look upon God as a person. That person may be a father, a mother, or a friend a child even. All these ideas are accommodated in Hinduism. And so, a Divine Mother, God who is being looked upon as Mother. But if you look at the Hindu Hindus use images of the Divine Mother. Images are no other than so many symbols. This image is not what exactly God is. Hindus make some images of God, sometimes with clay and all these things and and color it and make it look nice. It's a beautiful woman. And then that she's that is the image of the divine mother. And sometimes you will see that the divine mother has many many arms. And you say, what is this? So many arms. <laughs> for it, for example, the divinity or that divine mother who is called Durga, she has ten arms. Each arm is the symbol of a special power of the Divine Mother. If we have to express that idea through a symbol, then God has to be given more arms. And so these images are not what God actually is. That is known in Hinduism. That's why when the image is or real image of a divine mother is worshipped, after the worship, they take the image and drown it in water. There is no more need for that image. That is the idea. This idea of symbols is there in other religions also. For example, in Christianity, the cross is considered a very sacred symbol. But this was a, an implement of torture in the past. People would be crucified. But as the Jesus was crucified, that's why 
that cross has become something holy. It is a symbol only. So the Divine Mother is no other than divinity which is being considered a mother by those of us who are in the world, in this world of time, space and causation. And we are in this world of time, space and causation because we have minds and every mind has ego. Ego means I or self. We are not that ego. We are beyond our ego. Because the owner and the object owned cannot be the same. They have to be separate from each other. If I own a car, I cannot be that car because I am the owner. The same way I cannot be my physical body, I cannot be my senses, I cannot be my physical strength because I own all of them. And I cannot be my mind also because I own my mind. But there something has happened. My idea of my individual existence is a thought of my conscious mind. I or ego is a thought. So, strictly so speaking, we cannot be that ego. We have to transcend that ego. Then we will be what we really are. We are divinity itself. Infinity, eternity, consciousness, that divinity. The other day I was saying <laughs> to some of my friends that we all individuals are like waves in the ocean of divinity. Ocean <laughs> is limitless almost infinity and and waves each web is an individual each web thinks that it ex, it is different from other waves you go to a certain web and the had the waves had the power to talk and then he will say you are a web and the web will say yes i am the largest web here Look at other waves, they are much smaller than me. Then, <laughs> much smaller than me, I am bigger than them. Here the wave is an individual who is identifying with his form and that's how it is. But we know that if this identification is gone, then the all individuals will become the infinite ocean. So also Divine Mother or Divine Father, they are all divinity. They are all divinity, but from our point of view, there is a Divine Father, there is a Divine Mother and so on. Because we are identified with our ego. That's why Swami Vivekananda used to say that unselfishness is divinity. And selfishness comes from ego. If there is an ego, there will be selfishness. Ego is the self. So unselfishness is divinity. You have to transcend that ego. That is divinity. And it is strange that in every individual being, there is a tendency to go beyond limits. Once a little boy came here, he was wearing some kind of robe. I asked him, what is that robe you are wearing? Then he turned around and on that robe, a big capital S, letter S was there. Then he turned back to me and said, 
I am Superman Swami. Superman. <laughs> you, you are a Superman? <laughs> he was not even a super boy. He said, yes, I am Superman. I can fly through the air. I can kill elephants, tigers, lions. <laughs> the little boy was saying all those things. The little boy wanted to transcend limits. A person who has only $10,000 he is not happy with that amount. He wants to acquire a million dollars. Then he is a little happier. But then when he compares himself with others who are billionaires, then that person becomes unhappy and wants to <laughs> get more money. So <laughs> that is, we have a craving for infinity in us. We are not satisfied with anything which is finite. Finite beauty, finite strength, finite wealth. No, we are not satisfied. Because in inherently we are infinity. Infinity is divinity. So that's why all the theistic scriptures of the world, they say that God is omnipresent. God is present everywhere, in every person, in every individual. We are all divine. When Jesus Christ, he gave his last teaching, highest teaching, he gave some lower teachings also. Then he said, the highest teaching is, be ye perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. That is, you have to be divine. And in Hinduism also, they say, Tattamasi, you are that divinity. Aham Brahmasmi, I am also divinity. Sarvam Khalu Idam Brahma, everything is divinity. These are truths which we have to experience sooner or later. How to do that? By transcending our divinity. And how to do that? <laughs> By becoming unselfish. So unselfishness, practicing <laughs> unselfishness will eventually give us the experience of divinity. Then we won't, won't be there. <laughs> Only divinity will be there. Mm. This is a great idea that is why. Until that condition has come, we have to look, we have no other alternative but to look upon God as either father or mother. And Sri Ramakrishna used to say that God is divine mother. Why mother? Because when God creates, God is considered a female. In most of the scriptures of Hinduism are written in Sanskrit. And so when God creates, God's, God's creative energy is called Sijani Shakti, and that Shakti has feminine gender. That's why God, when God creates, God becomes a female, so to say, <laughs> and then God becomes a mother. And mothers give birth to babies, you know. So the Divine Mother has given birth to this world. So this is about the Divine Mother. Thank you very much for being patient and sharing some of my thoughts.